Hello friend, welcome back to my kitchen. My name is Becky if you're new. Today we are making a six course Valentine's Day dinner and I am making all of these things today. Normally when I do big dinners like this, I like to break it up into multiple days. Well today we are gonna make the whole entire course dinner right now. And the first thing we're gonna do is I actually did go ahead and get some bread started yesterday because that did need to sit for overnight. I'm recipe testing a ciabatta bread recipe. So the first thing I'm actually gonna do is preheat the oven to 350. I will share with you how I made that. Not 350, 425. So we're gonna get the oven preheated to 425, shape this loaf of bread, and then we're gonna start on our chocolate mousse. We're gonna start with this because this needs to chill for a few hours before we can have actually serve it because it has to set. I've never made chocolate mousse before. Actually, all of these recipes except for the chicken recipe, the main dish, braised white wine chicken are all new recipes to me today. So let's start with this bread. I don't know if this is gonna turn out, but we're gonna go for it. What I did the night before is I used my scale and I measured out water and bread flour. I sprinkled in some yeast and salt. I mixed that up. I let that sit and you can let it sit anywhere from 18 to 24 hours and then we are going to bake it up this day. I'm working on a series of no need bread recipes and this is one that I've been just kind of tweaking and testing out to see if we can come up with the perfect no need ciabatta bread recipe. I love no need recipes. I've got a just a rustic loaf that I make all the time. And I want to take that concept and kind of expand on it and come up with some roll recipes and a sandwich bread recipe, ciabatta, focaccia, all the really good ones. And so that's what I'm testing here. So we got that ready. I'm going to let that sit and we're going to bake that up in just a minute. Another thing I did the night before is I went ahead and ironed some new placemats I got. The older I get, the more I'm enjoying creating a beautiful tablescape. And so I went ahead and I got some new placemats for this dinner and some new napkins as well. So we're gonna create a beautiful table for this beautiful Valentine's Day dinner we are having on this night. So speaking of Valentine's Day, I wanna let you know that Greenstock is having a major Valentine's Day sale. It's a buy one, get one 60% off sale. And I will link them down below. This is what one of my four Greenstocks looked like last year. And I've got some big plans for it this year. This sale goes from February 14th through February 21st. So one entire week, this sale is going on. And I am just so excited for what this garden season has in store. And so if you've been interested in getting one of these green stock planters, now is a fantastic time. So here is what two of my other ones look like. And then I'm gonna show you in just a minute, this is what my nasturtium planter look like. So really, really beautiful. And I've got big plans for this coming growing season. So I'll link this green stock planter down below. First things first though, I need to get an apron on. I am a messy cook and that is why I love a good apron. And we're gonna be working with flour here. So we need to get an apron on. So I am working on some no need bread recipes and this is just a recipe that I am testing. I attempted it one other time and it needed more flour in it. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking it's probably gonna need more flour in it as well. But I'm excited to give this a try. Playing around with no need breads are one of my new favorite hobbies. So what I've got here is some parchment paper on a baking sheet. My bread that I started yesterday, I've been really playing around with how much water I can add and how much of a hydrated dough I can work with because the more hydrated the dough, the better the cr crumb is I have found on the bread. So I've got this bread here. I'm just kind of folding it on top of itself a little bit. It's gonna be a little bit easier to work with. And I've got a very generous amount of flour on my baking sheet. This is so sticky, that's why I'm using the help of this spatula. And I'm going to kind of fold this onto itself a couple times. Hydrated doughs are hard to work with, but they do create a delicious bread. 
Okay, so I've folded it onto itself a few times. I do want to make two smaller loaves. my two loaves here I'm going to sprinkle them again with some generous amount of flour and I'm going to shape them just by pushing them out just a little bit okay now I'm going to let them sit and rest so our first course is on its way to being done while our bread is rising we're going to get going on the chocolate mousse but I did want to show you that we are going to be decorating the table really beautiful again this is just a little fun special holiday that I want to celebrate my family and so I did pick up a few flowers so we're going to make some pretty tablescapes with the flowers I got and I did pick up some new placemats and napkins now I got these because they can kind of go for any holiday obviously these are very neutral and the red Yes, it's Valentine's Day, so it works, but these will also work for Christmas, and so it kind of fits into my rule when buying table decor or home decor. I like when I can get something that can go for multiple holidays, and then I do have some napkin rings that I got at the local thrift store. They're just a bunch of brass random ones, and so I wanna play around with decorating the table really beautiful. I did order some beeswax candles because I love the smell of these when they burn. It's a really clean, sweet scent, but these are so small. I didn't realize they came in different diameters, and so I'm gonna have to return these, and I ordered bigger ones. And they're supposed to be here today, but we'll see if they arrive in time for me to decorate the table. If I don't get my beeswax candles, no big deal. I've got some other candles I can use. So now that our bread is gonna rest while our oven is preheating before we can bake it, we're gonna get going on the chocolate mousse. Now, if you've watched the last few dinner parties I've done, I've been doing individual ramekin desserts and I love it. I think there's something super fun and kind of extra special about being able to serve just a single serving to each individual guest. Now this works, I think, when you have kind of a small, well, it works whether you have a big dinner party or a small dinner party. It's harder if you had like 25 or 30 people because then you would have to have a lot of ramekins. I think when you have a bigger group like that, like when we do dinner parties at my parents' house, you know, big cakes and things works really well to, for a dinner party because you don't have to have a bunch of ramekins. But for something small and a little bit more intimate, I've been loving making individual desserts and that's what we're gonna do today. So here, in a large bowl, we're gonna whisk a bunch of ingredients. So let me get all these ingredients out. One thing I'm really trying to get better at is reading through my entire recipe before I get started. And a recipe like this, I'm glad I'm doing it because I need quite a few different bowls. I need to add different ingredients to each one and I have a better understanding of what I need to do moving forward. So let's get ingredients into these bowls. I, of course, will link all of these recipes down below if you wanna try any of them. And I can link the new table decor stuff I got because I got that on Amazon. So if you're interested in trying that, I can link that down below. So the first thing I need to do is separate the egg whites and the egg yolks. I'm gonna put the egg yolks in a bowl and my egg whites in my mixer. I looked up a ton of recipes for chocolate mousse because this is something I have never done before. And there were all different ways to do this. So we're gonna use eggs, cream, and chocolate to make this mousse. That's why I chose this recipe because it kind of had all three of the good things I like in life in one recipe instead of just the two. So I need to make sure I keep all of this straight, what goes where. So into my egg yolks, I'm gonna add my sugar and I'm using my vanilla sugar because it has such amazing vanilla flavor. And we're supposed to whisk our sugar and egg yolks together for one minute. And I'm gonna get this on the stove to heat up. 
while I whisk this together. It's said to beat this for at least a minute until they lighten in color. And it becomes velvety. This looks absolutely velvety and delicious. So I'm gonna set this aside. And now I'm going to prep my chocolate, which we need seven ounces. These are four ounce bars. Okay, my cream is warm. I just caught that in time. You do not want this to boil, you just want this to be steamy, which we've got steam now. I was gonna chop this chocolate, but I think I probably could just break it up into our cream, because our cream is pretty warm. So we need definitely a whole one of these. We're basically making a ganache. I'm using a 60% cocoa in this. A couple of the recipes said to use different types of chocolate, and this is what I had. I did buy an extra bittersweet, but I thought that I would go with this one instead. So we're gonna just let that sit there until the chocolate kind of melts, and then we're gonna stir this together. You can see how the chocolate has now melted just by letting it sit. I let it sit for probably about three minutes or so, so now I'm gonna fully incorporate that chocolate into the cream mixture until it's fully incorporated. And this is how you make a ganache. Depending on how much cream you add to this is how runny your ganache would be or thick your ganache would be. Starting to fully incorporate. I want this to be fully incorporated before we start adding this into our egg yolk and vanilla mixture. I decided to add one ingredient that is not in the recipe, and Ina Garten would be proud of me. I'm gonna put some espresso powder into the chocolate mixture. She always says vanilla and coffee increase the chocolatiness of chocolate. So that's what I decided to add into this. I added a fourth of a teaspoon of espresso powder. And that's an instant espresso powder. All right, so this looks like it's fully incorporated and really velvety and smooth. So now what we're gonna do is slowly whisk the chocolate cream ganache into our egg yolk sugar mixture. or try to do it slowly. I need this chocolate mixture to completely cool to the touch. Our oven is preheated, so I'm gonna get our bread into the oven. And I have on the bottom of this oven a baking sheet that I preheated in the oven, and I'm gonna take a little bit of ice and to help create some steam while our bread bakes, I'm gonna put some ice in there. Now I'm gonna set my timer for about I got one more ice cube on the counter. I'm gonna put that in there too. For about 20 minutes. Since we need our chocolate to cool, I'm gonna also be making a sugar cookie to go along with it. I thought a pretty simple sugar cookie with the richness of a chocolate mousse. We're gonna get a little bit of a crunch from the cookie and the creaminess and silkiness from the mousse would be a good contrast. And the cookie needs to chill for a half an hour before we can bake it. So we got the bread in the oven, this is chilling. Let's get our cookie dough chilling as well. 
We're not actually making a sugar cookie, we're making a butter cookie, basically like a shortbread cookie. And I'm gonna do, go ahead and do this in the food processor because my mixer is already occupied with egg yolks. So in my food processor, I'm gonna put the blade attachment and we're actually gonna weigh these ingredients out. So I've got my scale here, I'm gonna zero this out. I know that I need one cup of butter. In the US that is two sticks. So I'm just gonna get my two sticks in there. 240 grams of flour, which I'm starting to memorize the gram to cup ratio of flour because I've been doing so much baking lately. So 240 grams is two cups of flour. And that's that right there. Zero that out. Salt, I'm gonna measure with my heart. And that was three grams, which this recipe calls for three grams. Look at that. Three grams of salt, three grams of salt. I would say I'm pretty proud of the fact that I just measured that with my heart and it was the correct amount. Now I'm gonna put whoop, 100 grams of my vanilla sugar in here. So how I made this vanilla sugar is after I made homemade vanilla extract, I took the vanilla pods after they had steeped for a year or more in my vodka or rum. I took those vanilla pods, I threw them in the dehydrator and then I went ahead and put them in a bunch of sugar and let that sit for a month or so and it creates the most incredible sugar. And I would have just thrown those vanilla pods away and now I get an extra special product with what would have been just compost. So I'm pretty happy with that. So now we need two egg yolks. One and two. And then I am gonna put a splash of vanilla in there. It already smells divine. I love recipes like this that just use really good ingredients to create a delicious, simple, Twist the opposite way to create a nice solid log of dough. So I'm gonna put this in the fridge to chill before we can bake it. Our chocolate mixture is now cool to the touch. It's room temperature so we can get going on the egg whites. Friend, I just tried the chocolate mixture and it is pretty incredible. So I think once we add the rest of these goodies, it's gonna be one delicious dessert. So here I've got my three egg whites. I'm gonna lock my mixer and I'm gonna whip this. until stiff peaks form. That didn't take very long. And there are our stiff peaks. It's holding its shape. So now we're gonna take this over to our chocolate mixture and we're gonna fold one third of the egg white into this chocolate mixture at a time. I have six ramekins out. I have a feeling this is going to make more than six because we haven't even added the cream yet to this, which I still need to whip up the cream to fold into this as well. But as I'm sitting here doing this, this is bringing back a core memory. When I was young, we didn't have TV growing up, so we would go to the library and get videos and books on tape and all sorts of things like that. And I have a very vivid core memory of going to the library and getting a cooking video. And it was like a video on recipes for kids to make. And I remember this chocolate mousse was one of the recipes they made. And it feels like it's full circle. I'm finally making a homemade chocolate mousse, which I've never done before. Another recipe they made in that video, which I've talked about and I've still never made to this day, which now it's even more encouraging me to do it 
is making homemade tortilla chips. And now that I've got a good system for making homemade corn flour tortillas, I think I can make homemade tortilla chips relatively easily now. I guess the frying part is the tricky part, but I've got the tortilla part I'm comfortable with. So I'm gonna have to be making homemade tortilla chips here pretty soon. So here, we don't have this fully incorporated and that's okay because now we need to make some whipped cream. I'm just gonna use this same bowl to make the whipped cream in. So that's why I liked the idea of this recipe because it had both cream and eggs versus some of the recipes it just was cream and some of the recipes was just egg. So we're gonna whip this to a stiff peak as well. The whipped cream is done, but before I can fold that in, I can see that our bread is done and look how beautiful that turned out. It's golden and crusty. I'm gonna turn the oven off because we don't need it now. And you know how sticky this dough was? You can see that, now that cookie sheet is hot, but it does peel off the cookie sheet even though it was so sticky. Those are perfect. So I'm gonna let those cool. Our whipped cream has a nice stiff peak to it, so we can get this incorporated into our chocolate mixture. And this is why it was okay that we didn't fully have the egg yolks incorporated. You wanna be very gentle when doing this and you don't want to mix it too vigorously because you wanna make sure you keep all that air that you work so hard to incorporate in the final mousse. I just grabbed two more ramekins because I think this is gonna make enough for eight. And our mousse is fully incorporated now at this point. Maybe there's a few little pockets of cream, but I'm okay with that. I'm thinking a scoop like this might be the easiest way to transfer it into our ramekins. So I got a little bit of chocolate on the rim of two of these, so I wanna make sure I clean those up so they have a beautiful edge. Two of the six recipes are done. I'm gonna pop this into the fridge. This needs to set for at least four hours before we can top it with the whipped cream and serve it. So that's gonna give us plenty of time to make the rest of our recipes set the table before we enjoy this beautiful feast tonight. I think we can go ahead and get our cookies cut out. And that way we can get these ready and we can have our desserts done. So we have two side vegetables we're gonna make. We're gonna make a Hasselback potato, not Hasselback potato. We're gonna make Hasselback butternut squash with the gremolata sauce. And we're also gonna make green beans plus our Riesling chicken. So we've got quite a bit more to go even though we are making progress. So here I have turbinado sugar. I think that's what this is called. The recipe calls for a clear sugar. I don't have that and I didn't wanna buy it because I have this. And I thought that this would be just as pretty on the outside of these cookies. So I'm gonna go ahead and take sugar and kind of put it out on my cutting board here. And we're gonna roll our cookie dough log into the sugar. This is gonna make a really pretty crunchy outside edge. When I was looking for recipes for this butter cookie, I wanted something that would remind me of those cookies you buy in a tin. I've always loved those and I've never attempted to make them. And that's what this cookie reminds me of with the sugar on the outside. 
So I'm just gonna cut the ends off and that's gonna be kind of bonus. We're gonna set those aside. And I think I need this to chill a little bit more, but I'm gonna go ahead and slice into this, get it on the cookie sheet, chill it, and then we'll bake it. So every time I cut this, I'm gonna rotate it so that I don't end up with a flat side on one side. And because this dough is a little bit soft still, I can kind of reshape it a little bit before I get it onto my cookie sheet. I wanna to try to get these the same size so they cook evenly. I'm gonna pop these into the fridge for about 20 more minutes and then we'll bake these off. So now we can get going on our side vegetables. The two vegetables we're gonna be having with tonight's dinner is a Hasselback butternut squash. It's actually a honey nut squash, which I grew in the garden, 2023's garden, and I've yet to try them. These are a very special variety of butternut squash. They're called a honey nut and you can see they're almost personal size. And we are going to hassle back these. And I think it's called a gremolata sauce we're gonna make. So we're gonna make Hasselback honey nut with hazelnut gremolata. It's an herb hazelnut, kind of like a chimichurri, but it's a gremolata sauce. And I'm excited about that. These are supposed to be very special squash that they were specifically bred to be extremely sweet. And so I'm excited to try these. It feels like a really fitting time. Valentine's Day. It's not actually Valentine's Day. We're celebrating tonight, but today's not actually Valentine's Day, but it seems very fitting to pull out this really special sweet squash roasted up with an herbaceous nutty sauce. And one thing I've yet to grab out is a compost bowl because we haven't really needed to compost anything because we've just been working with dessert type things. So I've got my squash here that I trimmed the tops off. I'm looking for my vegetable peeler. I've also washed up my green beans because we are going to make garlic butter green beans. And I'm gonna actually peel this butternut squash or honey nut squash. So this honey nut variety of squash is a very special breed of butternut squash. It was bred for its flavor. A lot of the seeds today or varieties of fruits and vegetables are not necessarily bred for flavor. They're bred for yield because the more a farmer can grow in a smaller space, the better financial outcome for them. And two, they're bred for how well it withstands shipping or storage ability. So the breeder of this variety of squash worked with chefs because his ultimate goal because the chef's ultimate goal was to have a variety of squash that tasted incredible. And so that's kind of a cool, cool thing. And I've actually seen these squash sold at some farmer's markets and things like that now, and specialty grocery stores. So I'm gonna peel these. I think most of my peels are not ending up <laughs> in my bowl, they're ending up on my counter. So I'm gonna have to clean this up once I'm done with this. So all of this was on my counter. We're gonna get this into the compost bowl.
Now I'm gonna go ahead and prep my green beans. I am going to go ahead, I've washed them. Now I'm just gonna take the tops off of them. And I'm gonna get these in the pot that I'm gonna cook these in. I'm gonna keep them whole. I'm not gonna cut them down smaller. I'm excited about these fresh green beans because I have not had fresh green beans since the garden. We've gone through all of the frozen ones I put up. And I do have a few jars of canned green beans, but I kind of wanted fresh for this dinner tonight. Sauteed green beans with garlic and butter and salt and pepper are one of my favorite things to eat. And Josh made the best green beans I've ever had in my life one year for Valentine's Day when I think we were first married. I think it was our first Valentine's Day when we were married. He made garlic mashed potatoes, sauteed green beans, and steak. And it was incredible. So now I kind of always associate green beans for Valentine's Day for when Josh and I celebrate together because I just always think of that amazing dish that he made or meal that he made for us. Some people like to snap both ends off. We don't mind eating like the curly part on the one end of the green bean. So I'm only snapping the end off that used to be attached to the green bean plant. Now we're gonna make our gremolata sauce for the squash. We don't need to cut that into Hasselback quite yet. We have to roast it first. But right now I'm gonna go ahead and make the gremolata sauce. And I'm gonna go ahead and do that in my blender. You could use a food processor, blender, whatever you have. My food processor I already used to make the cookies and I actually have those in the dishwasher right now. So we're gonna use the blender first. So in my blender, the first thing I'm gonna put, I actually need to grab them. I have some dry roasted hazelnuts. And if these were raw hazelnuts, I would toast them first, but these are already toasted, so I don't need to do that. Start with about a third of a cup. I'm gonna blend these first just to start chopping them. Now that they're about halfway chopped, I'm gonna add one full bunch of parsley that has definitely been washed. The zest of a lemon. Anytime I use lemon zest or any kind of citrus zest, I always make sure I wash that fruit really, really well. I'm gonna juice the whole lemon in here. I'm gonna put one of my garlic pucks in there. And then this recipe called for a very specific pickled pepper. I could not find that at the store. I have these mama lily peppers, so I'm gonna go ahead and use these instead. They're a pickled pepper in an oil, and it's delicious. So I'm gonna get a couple of those in there. And quite a bit of olive oil. A very high quality olive oil because you're gonna really taste the olive oil. That was about a cup, which was the rest of that jar. Now I'm gonna give it a taste test for salt and pepper and citrus. I have never made anything like this before. Wow. That's perfect. You can taste the garlic. You kind of get that spiciness of the garlic. Yum. Oh my goodness. I think I'm gonna blend it a little bit more because it's, well, maybe I do want it a little bit chunky because I'm gonna pour this over top of my squash. I think I want it to have a little bit of texture to it so that we're gonna have like the soft squash and then the herbaceous, crunchy gremolata sauce. I'm gonna pop this into the fridge. I'm gonna go ahead and get the oven preheated for 350 for our cookies so we can bake those off. And I'm gonna get this oven preheated to 425 so we can do the first bake on our squash. The squash has two bakes 
it has to do. We're first going to season our squash with some oil, salt, and pepper. We're gonna bake this off for about 15, 20 minutes until they're soft, and then we will cut them into the Hasselback shape. So a little oil, a little bit of pepper, and a little bit of salt. I'm gonna rub all that around so it's evenly distributed. Now that our oven is preheated, we can get our squash into the oven for the first bake, 15 minutes. Now there is one more component to our squash. So the first thing we need to do is bake the squash. Once it's tender, we can hassle back it, but there is gonna be a glaze that we're gonna put on it when we put it back in the oven, and then we're gonna to top it with the gremolata sauce. So let's go ahead and make that glaze now. In this bowl, I have about three tablespoons of butter now I'm gonna add about a quarter cup of maple syrup. I'm just eyeballing this. And two tablespoons of white balsamic, which I don't have, but I have white wine vinegar. So I'm gonna go ahead and use that. And that is gonna be our glaze that will brush onto the squash once it's hassle-backed. So I'm just gonna mix that together and there we go. I just tasted that maple vinegar butter glaze, that is delicious. I've never thought to do something like that before, and I am a convert, I love that. So I'm excited to see how this squash dish turns out because there's definitely quite a few components to it. So now we are cooking with fire. Our 350 degree oven is preheated so we can get our cookies in the oven, and then we can get started on the chicken. Once I have the chicken in the oven, then we will go ahead and set the table. I just did a little refresh on the kitchen and I was rereading my recipes. This is the chicken one I'm gonna be making, but I was rereading the, which I'll link again, all these recipes down below. These one here. And I did not realize our glaze is supposed to be glaze consistency. So we actually need to reduce this butter, honey, vinegar mixture by half. So I'm gonna put it in this pot, get this a boiling, and then it's gonna be nice and sticky and glazy. And so when we brush it onto our squash, it'll actually stick onto it, which makes sense. I just missed that step. So my kitchen is cleaned back up. My, my dishwasher has 15 minutes left on it, and then I can unload it and load it back up so I don't have a ton of dishes once it's dinner time. I'm gonna put this glaze actually back here, and we can get going on our chicken. So that means I need to run to the garden and grab some sage. Last time I was out in the garden, I think everything has basically died at this point, except the sage and the thyme. I'm pretty sure the sage is still good out here. We had a very hard freeze, a good couple inches of ice on everything. And the garlic looks good. The green onions look good. Thyme looks good. All the rest of it looks pretty bad. So I'm hoping, I haven't checked the sage. I'm hoping the sage is okay. I didn't come and look out here before I went to the grocery store. And look what I just caught out the corner of my eye. That is a volunteer cilantro plant, which is pretty funny. I have no cilantro growing in my garden, but I've got it growing <laughs> in my walkway. So sage is over here. It's not looking too great, but I think we're gonna be able to harvest just enough off of it to make dinner tonight. I'm happy with the thickness and glaziness of this. It's gonna thicken as it cools, so I'm gonna turn the stove off. I think these are done. They're kind of golden brown around the outside. They kind of swoop down a little bit. That's not a word more than I was expecting, even though they went into the oven really cold, but I still think they're really beautiful. And I think what I'm gonna do, which I've never done before, but I've seen this go around online a bunch, is you take a cookie cutter, and to get them round again, I think I need a smaller one. I don't know if this is really working. OK, 
Okay, I'm gonna let these cool completely before I transfer them to a cooling rack. Just took my squash out of the oven. It's par-baked now at this point, and we're gonna hassle back it. So what I think I'm gonna do is to take two chopsticks and put those underneath the squash so that, oh, see, I don't wanna slice that far. I'm stopping on the chopstick before I get all the way to the bottom of the cutting board. The last thing I need to prep for tonight's dinner are two shallots. I actually, I think I'm gonna go ahead and do one more. So we're gonna prep three shallots. Now we're gonna get going on the main course, which is our chicken here. This is bone in skin on chicken. And I'm just gonna open these up and cut off any excess skin here that I see. So that's perfect. And these are chicken thighs. And I'm just gonna prep them for starting the braising process. For the main dish, we are going to braise our chicken. And I found a recipe, but then I was reading it and then I found another one. And I'm gonna kind of make up my own between the two, I'm gonna adapt it. But we're gonna use this, the common thread between them is it's gonna be a white wine braised chicken. And this is called a braiser. That's what type of pan this is. When Josh and I were first dating, I cooked for him all the time. I still cook for him all the time. And I found this type of cooking technique that I didn't grow up with. My mom didn't cook this way. And it's braising. Braising is basically like a slow cook where you have, it's not a poach and it's not a sear. It's kind of in between. So typically when you braise meat, you will sear the meat and then you will cover it about halfway up the meat, whether it's red meat or white meat. And then you will cook it in the oven and that it kind of, it's a slow cook and it's called braising. And it's something that I didn't grow up with. And so when Josh and I were dating, I would make him braise dishes all the time because I found the amount of flavor you can develop in a braised dish is incredible. And so I think, I can't remember if we were married or still dating when he bought me this pan. This is an investment piece of cookware. You don't have to have it. You could use something like this. You need an oven safe pot with a lid. A lot of people when they're braising like big cuts of meat, like beef, technically the way that I like to make my roast is a braise. You could use a Dutch oven as well. But this is what this pot is. And I love this piece of cookware because it was a gift and it means a lot to me. So in this brazer, which this is an enamel cast iron, pan, I can link this down below, but no, this is an investment piece of cookware and it is something that's super special to me. I actually am going to use bacon fat to sear my chicken because one of the recipes out of the two that I'm following calls for bacon. And I don't wanna put bacon in this, but I want some of that bacon flavor. And a way I can get that is by searing my chicken in bacon grease. 
So I'm gonna put a couple tablespoons in here and I've got my chicken that I cleaned up and I'm gonna pat this dry. I want the skin to be very, very dry so that when I put it into my hot oil, it's gonna sear and not steam. And I don't like to put my salt on my chicken when I'm braising it until right before it goes on the heat so that it doesn't draw out a bunch of moisture. Okay, I'm gonna wash my hands really well. Another thing, I don't wanna overcrowd my pan, so I'm just gonna do three of these at a time. The searing portion of this is not at all to cook the chicken fully through. What our goal is with searing the chicken is one, to get a very dark color on the chicken so that we can start building flavor on the chicken and we can start building flavor in our pot because in our pan is where we're going to be building our sauce and so we want to sear this chicken very very well so this pan is hot i'm going to put it skin side down season the other side of it and i'm going to let that sit on each side for a good four to five minutes if not longer as long as it takes to get that skin dark and crispy and delicious. So that took probably 15, 20 minutes. So in that time span, what I was doing in the meantime is I started making the flower arrangements. The older I get, the more and more I love flowers and I can just appreciate the beauty that flowers bring. When I first started gardening, I only wanted to grow food. I thought that was practical and fun and that's all I wanted. But the more and more I get into gardening, the more and more I'm loving growing flowers. So one of my big goals for 2024's garden is to not only have an abundant vegetable garden, but we are going to be growing a bunch of flowers so that we can be bringing in homegrown flowers into the home all growing season and enjoy the beauty that they bring. So we can be eating off the garden and also just enjoying the beauty. So here, I just picked these up at my local grocery store because I have nothing growing in my garden at this point and I wanted to bring in some of that beauty that flowers have. So I've got some eucalyptus here. I'm actually gonna be growing three varieties of eucalyptus in the garden this year, as long as all goes according to plan. And I am just trimming them down and getting them into these wide mouth mason jars. Now, the first time I trimmed them, they weren't quite short enough because this variety of eucalyptus is pretty floppy. So I just trimmed it down a little bit more so that hopefully that eucalyptus would stand up just a little bit better in my jar. Now, I also went ahead and I purchased some pink tulips and I also got some white baby's breath. I wasn't exactly sure when I first went into these arrangements what exactly I was going to do. So I originally arranged them with eucalyptus first and then three to four tulips in each jar and then some of the baby's breath in each jar. Baby's breath holds a special place in my heart. When Josh and I got married, we didn't have a ton of money to spend on flowers and it was really before I had even fallen in love with flowers like I have now. And so what we did that was very affordable is we actually decorated our tables at our wedding with baby's breath and that was it. So we had a wide mouth mason jar and baby's breath in it and it was on a wood round on a table. And I thought it was absolutely beautiful. Even to this day, I think it was really beautiful even though it was very, very simple. And today though, I wanted a little bit more color so that's why I decided to add the eucalyptus and the tulips. Now you're gonna see in just a bit that I end up removing the tulips and doing something different with them because I didn't think the pink with the tulips matched my napkins because I went ahead and I did get some of these kind of maroon napkins. And so you're gonna see how I end up still using the tulips but just not on the table. And I wasn't sure how I wanted to fold the napkins yet for the table. So I went ahead and I knew that we were going to have plates on the table. So I put the plates on the table and the forks. And at this point, my chicken needs my attention. Again, this is the last round of chicken. It is seared now on one side. I'm going to flip it. And once it's seared on the other side, then we are going to go ahead and finish our sauce to braise our chicken in. 
My chicken is nice and browned now at this point. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue to build the sauce in our pan. And the first thing I'm gonna do to this hot pan with all of those browned drippings is we are gonna add our shallots. And now this is how we are gonna build the sauce that we're actually gonna braise our chicken in. We're gonna use the moisture that's being released from the shallots to start to deglaze the bottom of this pan. So the brown bits that the chicken left behind has tons of incredible savory umami flavor. And so now we are going to remove that brown bits from the bottom of the pan with the moisture from the onions. To that, I'm going to add our sage leaves that we harvested from the garden, quite a bit of fresh garlic that was minced, salt and pepper, and then a big dollop of Dijon mustard. And we're going to mix that around. And this is just the start of our sauce that we are going to cook our chicken in in the oven. We're actually gonna finish cooking our chicken in the oven. When Josh and I were dating, I made something similar to this. I could not find that original recipe. It's buried somewhere in my Pinterest feed from 10 plus years ago. So what I am doing is, like I said, I'm combining two recipes. The original recipe I found for this was a sage, white wine, a dry Riesling, and cream sauce. But it only had a half a cup of wine, and I remember the recipe I made for him had a lot more than that. And so then I just found another one, but it didn't have all the components I wanted that this one did. So that's why we're combining it. So I will let you know what I'm doing. So if you want to replicate this, you can, because I'm not following a strict written recipe that I found online. So now we are going to add just a little bit of flour so that we can have a little bit of a roux, but not too much. I'm gonna cook that flour out, close all my drawers behind me. I also did go ahead and I made just a baby's breath little bouquet that I'm gonna set on the island when I serve the food on the island. Just to add some beauty. So this is now cooked to perfection. So I'm gonna add two cups of wine. This is a dry Riesling. smells good. When I was at Trader Joe's, I asked for a recommendation from one of the men that was working in the wine section, and this is the one he recommended. So I'm going to have this wine reduced by at least half. Once our wine has reduced, then I'm going to add about a cup of chicken broth, and then we're going to let that simmer for a little bit, and then we're going to add our chicken to it. When Ever you're braising, you want your liquid mixture covering your meat or vegetables by about half, because you can braise vegetables as well. That is kind of the signature when it comes to braising. You're not poaching it, so you don't have your meat fully submerged. You have it covered about halfway, and that is what kind of is signature when it comes to braising. Now, if you don't want to use wine in your braised dish, wine's very traditional, you don't have to. You could just use broth and maybe a couple tablespoons of white wine vinegar or a couple tablespoons of balsamic vinegar, and that can give you that little zip or zing or acidity that wine is doing in this recipe without actually having to cook with wine. So that's just a little substitution there if you want to do that as opposed to cooking with wine. So now that I have my chicken in here, it's covered about halfway, I'm going to go ahead and put the lid on it. And now I'm gonna go ahead and get this into the oven. And this is gonna take a good 45 minutes to an hour to cook, which is perfect timing. You know what, I think I need to adjust this. I love braising chicken thighs because they're a lot more forgiving than breast but you can do the whole bird as well. When I first started doing this braising technique, that's when I actually learned to break down a whole chicken because a lot of braising recipes will talk about taking a whole chicken, breaking it into its different parts, and then braising it in the oven like this. So this is in here. We do need to put our first glaze onto our butternut squash. 
I did not have this butternut squash in the oven the whole time. I just put this in about 10 minutes before I put the chicken in the oven. So this is now been cooking for about 10 minutes at 450 degrees. So I'm gonna take this glaze that we reduced down earlier and I'm gonna put it all over the squash. And we're gonna do this a few times until we have a nice crusty crust on our Hasselback butternut squash. I'm gonna get the kitchen reset, get the dishes, unload the dishwasher, load the dishwasher, and I'm gonna finish setting my table. And there's a dirty towel <laughs> that needs to go into the dirty clothes. At this point, all of our components for our dinner are prepped and ready to either be turned on and cooked, so the green beans haven't cooked at all yet, but every other component is either completely done or it's in the oven cooking. So that gave me a few minutes to set the table and finish setting the table. So I just got these maroon napkins and I didn't think that they matched the pink tulips. So I ended up taking the tulips out of the flower arrangements we made earlier and you're gonna see where I'm gonna put those. But I really liked the red napkins. I've never had a colored napkin before and I just thought this was really pretty. And the way that I am decorating the napkins is I am taking them and running them through the napkin holder. I've had these napkin holders for like three years now. I've never used them and I just thought that they were the perfect napkin holder for this tablescape. So now you can see the flower arrangements are just baby's breath and eucalyptus. And then I'm grabbing a few of my random candle holders and I'm gonna get those on the table. My beeswax candles never came and so I'm just gonna put some white candles on the table along with a wine glass and everyone will also get a water glass as well. The food is in the oven. The only thing I still have to cook is the green beans and those are only gonna take like 15 minutes. And the table is set. I'm gonna go ahead and make the whipped cream before my guests get here. It's 5.46 right now. I don't even think I mentioned this to you, but dinner is at 6.30 tonight. And so I'm gonna go ahead and get the whipped cream made for our mousse. I forgot I already had gotten this one out. So for the whipped cream, I'm gonna put about a cup. Maybe I'll put a little bit more in there. So it's a good thing I got this one out. So maybe a cup and a half. And then I'm gonna do maple flavored just to add a little bit of complexity. So we're gonna get that in there and whisk this until a nice peak forms. So while my whipped cream is whipping and my guests are gonna be here not that long, I'm gonna go ahead and get my candles lit. The whipped cream is off because that is now done. I'm gonna get it topped on our mousse, but I wanna get my second round of the butter glaze on here. I didn't quite think that these pink tulips matched the red napkins. So I went ahead and I just put the pink tulips in a little jar and we're gonna use those to decorate the island. Then I have my chocolate mousse in here and they've set up beautifully. I'm just gonna put a nice little dollop on here. And it looks like I made way more whipped cream than I need, but that's okay. That'll go in my morning coffee. You could probably, if you did a little stiffer peak than I did here, you could probably grab a piping bag and pipe these. The squash is done. I don't wanna take it out of the oven yet because I wanna keep it warm. I did pull out the serving platter. I'm gonna serve it on because the parchment paper is looking a little burned and it's 6.09 right now. I'm gonna go ahead and get started on the green beans. I'm going to just add about a cup of water in there and I'm gonna steam these green beans in this pot until they're tender and I will have all of the liquid evaporate. Once it evaporates, I am going to add a big knob of garlic, salt, and pepper. And I want all that water to evaporate. I'll also add some butter and I'm gonna blister the green beans and so they're nice and blistery. Let's take a look at our chicken and see how our chicken is doing. Can you see all that steam coming out of there? Oh my goodness, look at that. Yum. 
So I want that skin to get nice and crispy again, but I want to add my cream. I'm just going to kind of put it around. That's why we made crusty bread to soak up that sauce. So now I'm going to go ahead and close this back, but I'm going to leave the lid off for the last like 20 minutes or so. So I want to see how this bread turned out. Oh my goodness, look at those big bubbles. You get that really big bubbles in bread with that super hydrated dough. It might be hard to work with when it's that hydrated, but oh my goodness, it's gonna have the best, chewiest, yummy texture to sop up all that yummy flavor. I think we'll definitely go through these two loaves of bread. Right when I was slicing the bread, the grandparents arrived and that is who is joining us for dinner tonight. And so it's full steam ahead. All of the components at this point are basically prepped and done. And now we just get to pull the whole dinner party together. So our bread is cooked. This bread turned out so well. It was so delicious. It's a little tricky to work with up front because it's so sticky, but it is worth it because the final chewiness you get from that is just delicious. So here are the green beans. I steamed these green beans for a little bit. Once they were the bright green color I was looking for, I did pour off the excess water and then now I just added my garlic, butter, salt, and pepper and I'm going to saute that for about a minute to cook the garlic and our green beans are done. Now our squash is out of the oven and friend let me tell you this recipe was divine. The glaze with the vinegar and butter and maple syrup just created this sticky, delicious crust on these Hasselback squash. And then to pair that with the gremolata sauce, this was an elevated roast vegetable dish that I will definitely make again. But I want to take this concept of using a vinegar sweet buttery glaze on other types of roast vegetables because it was so good. I've never thought to add vinegar to roast vegetables before and then to top it off with the gremolata sauce. My goodness, it was delicious. So I'm going to get the green beans plated up. Now I did have extra gremolata sauce, so I ended up just leaving the sauce on the island. So if people wanted a little extra gremolata sauce for their bread or the chicken or whatever it might be, it was available. And this is what the entire dinner looks like pulled together. It was so yummy and comforting and just absolutely delicious. So those were the savory recipes. Here is the dessert. You can see I ended up putting the tulips and the baby's breath with a candle next to the dessert. And the buttery cookies dipped into the mousse was a winning combination. I think the mousse just benefited from having a crunchy element and that butter cookie was perfect for it. So now I'm gonna turn the lights down. I'm gonna light the candles. I have music going and we are just gonna sit and enjoy family. And that is what Valentine's Day means to me. I love love. I love my family. I love food and sitting down at the table with the ones I love is my idea of a perfect Valentine's Day. So friend, I want to wish you a happy Valentine's Day. I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for being you. If you enjoyed this, I'll pop a couple of my other videos here. You can go enjoy between now and my next upload. I hope you are having a fantastic day and I can't wait to see you next time. Bye friend.